Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are about at that time. Um, so I'm going to have Madeline mute everybody and we'll go from there. Um, which means I'll have to wait and re unmute myself probably. So. So here we are. Um, we made a couple technical tweaks um, to worship this morning. If you are, if we know you're speaking or playing music, we've made you a co-host so you can unmute yourself automatically. So as far as I know, that's Tom and Mary, because Tom is our liturgist today and Mary's our musician. So Tom will get to handle all of that. And Granger's one of our other musicians. And so he's got that as well. And then Madeline will be doing the rest of the crazy muting and unmuting um, for everybody. A um, couple of, of quick weird calendar notes. Yes, it is somehow the third Sunday in June. I'm still not sure how that happened. Um, we're gonna wrap up our four week series on the Lord's Prayer next Sunday. And the first Sunday in July, we are going to have Benjamin and Tricia uh, lead worship for us and give us their year's reflection on things because I did not want us to miss that. And since, well, since everything is weird anyway, how, how weird is it to have our preachers be 4,789 miles away? They've already done music from there. So, um, so that'll be July 5th, and then we'll start into some other things in July and go from there. Um, in the world of weird Presbyterian stuff, General Assembly is meeting online, <laughs> which means they're not quite meeting on the same marathon calendar schedule um, all in one place, but it's still quite the marathon um, of staring at your screen for way too many hours in a row and hoping you're muted and hoping you're unmuted and those sorts of things. So um, the way the General Assembly is set up this year is to basically do exactly what had to be done legally um, for this time period and then to, to go on with things. Because of the circumstances, every year, every year GA meets, they could use your prayer, but they could particularly use your prayer this year. So uh, keep the commissioners, um, the administrative staff, certainly keep the tech team in your prayers um, over the next week or 10 days or so, um, that sort of thing. Um, other announcements, due to uh, hard work by Ron Campbell and the Evans crew, our blessing box and JJ, our blessing box is almost ready to go out. I think it is ready to go out and be mounted on the poles as soon as they meet Ron's um, strength test for anchoring. Um, I think he's gonna go out and jump on them 15 times or something, and if they don't move, then it's safe. But it looks great, that's gonna go out. Uh, this week, so you, hopefully this week or next week, so you should get some information in your email about how we're going to stock that and what it's what it's there for and those sorts of things. That's going to be mounted um, by the northern um, handicap parking spaces. So there's two posts in the ground there. I know most of you haven't driven by the church as much as you might in a normal time, but that's what those posts in the ground are for. They're not just to make sure people don't drive into the grass right there. Um, the Little Free Library, hopefully we'll manage to get the, the kids to paint it with the pattern they designed and get that up before too terribly much longer, but life is weird. Um, your plan should get out to you this next week. Lee was working on that very hard. It's got a bunch of July things in it. Um, it's amazing we're not here, but we're still just as busy as we have been. Um, We've got another turn at the soup kitchen coming up in July um, that you should have gotten an email about. So those sorts of things. Also, please do, um, please do let your deacon know what your personal comfort level is at on getting back into the building for worship. Um, who we have who's ready to get back in and what kind of clumps and family sizes they're in is going to determine how we set up the space and what we can do and those sorts of things. So letting us know that um, is really important. So let your deacon know or let me know. Um, the deacon should be calling everybody on their care lists um, 
so that we can make sure that that happens and it happens as safely as we possibly can. Um, other than that, somehow it is the inexorable return of Sunday. There is one of these every week and it is time for the people of God to be the people of God. So welcome and let us worship God. Spotlight, Tom. Yeah, I uh, had have to deal with deal with the microphone change here. Okay. Join us in the call to worship, please. God is King, robed and ruling. God is robed and surging with strength. And yes, the world is firm, immovable. Your throne, ever firm. Your eternal. What you say goes. It always has. Beauty and holy mark your palace rule, God, to the very end of time. Please join us in the hymn of praise, uh, verses 1 through 3, number... 310. I love the kingdom, a kingdom Lord. Verses one and three. Oh, did I say three? One and three, yes. confession we know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of god in jesus christ let us in freedom confess the wrong we have done please join me in the prayer of confession righteous god you have crowned jesus christ as lord of all we confess that we have not bowed before him and are slow to acknowledge his rule we give allegiance to the powers of the world, this world, and fail to be governed by justice and love. In your mercy, forgive us. Raise us to acclaim him as ruler of all, that we may be loyal ambassadors, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. A sort of brief uh, minute for mission. For church camps around the country and around the world, everything has changed this summer. And for a lot of families, everything has changed this summer. Uh, this pause, like at Camp Carew, just doing virtual camp or a number of other camps, likewise doing limited things, is gonna be a challenge both financially and in terms of volunteers for years to come. Um, 
Laurel Evans was going to be one of the counselors this summer at Carew. She's going to miss a year of that true experience and a bunch of the kids who would have been counselors in training are going to miss that year um, to see if this is really something they liked or just what they got stuck with doing because they were too old for the other camps. Um, so I'd invite you to keep in prayer all of the programs that are kind of missing a year out there and what that means for both experiences and leadership development and, and community building and all of those opportunities that kids, youth, and adults have to gather together and work together that are just on hold right now. So please hold that in your prayers over the weeks ahead. That brings us to our first lesson for today, which is in the sixth chapter of Matthew. Um, Jesus speaks to the disciples saying, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow's will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. child of the light, I want to follow Jesus. God sent the stars to give light to the world. The star of my life is Jesus. In him there is no darkness at all, the night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. I want to see the brightness of God. I want to look at Jesus. Dear Son of Righteousness, shine on my path and show me the way to the Father. In Him there is no darkness at all, the night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. That brings us to our second lesson. Um, it's an apocalyptic lesson from the seventh chapter of Daniel. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was troubled within me. 
and the visions of my head terrified me. I approached one of the attendants to ask him the truth concerning all of this. So he said that he would disclose to me the interpretation of the matter. As for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth. But the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth concerning the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces, and stamped what was left with its feet, and concerning the ten horns that were on its head, concerning the other horn which came up and to make room for which three of them fell out, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke arrogantly and that seemed greater than the others. As I looked, this horn made war with the holy ones and was prevailing over them until the ancient one came. Then judgment was given for the holy ones of the Most High, and the time arrived when the holy ones gained possession of the kingdom. This is what he said. As for the fourth beast... There shall be a fourth kingdom on earth that is different from all the other kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise and another shall rise after them. This one shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, shall wear out the holy ones of the Most High, and shall attempt to change the sacred seasons and the law. They will be given into his power for a time, two times, and half a time. Then the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, to be consumed and totally destroyed. The kingship and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the holy ones of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Um, we have this challenge when we talk about the kingdom of God, partly because we're Americans and we really don't do kings, and partly because we struggle with the idea of one person being in charge of all of that. And partly because we just really don't like the language sometimes. So when we come to the part of the Lord's Prayer, which is the second and the third clause about thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, these are really loaded passages. In Sunday school, we looked at how the longer Westminster Catechism describes the content of these like 12 words, and it takes them like 14 lines of text to get through everything that is implied and contained in the sense of the kingdom of God. And so there's a lot going on here. Um, and I'm not going to manage to address every aspect of the kingdom of God today because we'd all like to be off the screen before, say, 4, 5, or 6 p.m. tonight. So this will be what it is, um, and we'll assume I'll get other sermons to talk about the rest of it. Historically, the church has viewed the kingdom as either something that only God can bring about or something that we can slowly and incrementally move towards Really, no divine intervention required. Now, I happen to think that the truth is probably somewhere in between those two things. Not that we can just sit here and go, la, 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 I'm just living my life. Jesus will fix it later. And not being um, so vain enough to think that me and mine can enact the kingdom of God on earth all by our lonesomes. I think it's going to take a blend of those two things. And so for me, reading these texts, um, one of the pieces about the kingdom of God is that we don't work the way we work now, okay? I know that there are at least three other workaholics in this congregation other than me. I know that there's at least three of you 
And there may be well more than that. Um, later, we can take a pool on who, who the three are, but uh, I'll let you guys decide that for yourselves. But there's a sense that this is not our work alone. This is work we do with God and that if we are seeking after the kingdom of God first and its righteousness, everything else will fall into place. Now, this is not one of those sermons I used to hear on AM radio when I was driving to college through West Virginia, and that was the only station you could get, and they were ranting about why you didn't need insurance using this scripture passage. Yes, I believe we have some work to do. Um, but that sense of worry that occupies so many of us so much of the time, I think is one of the pieces that we need to be able to put down when we say we trust in God and we ask for the kingdom to come. Because we worry an awful lot, quite often about things we have no ability to change. We worry about the weather. How many of you control the weather? Raise your hands if you control the weather. Because if you do, I have a bone to pick with you. John, pick, John controls the weather. I saw that, Susan. Um, we spend an inordinate amount of time worrying about the weather. We spend an inordinate amount of time worrying about what other people will do that we have no control over. Part of the challenge for us as people of faith in wanting to see the kingdom is to be willing to admit that we can't do it ourselves. That is typically the challenge on our side of the aisle is that we think if we're just faithful enough, long enough, the kingdom will make its way here. It's going to take some Jesus people. It's going to take a lot of Jesus people. Um, and so I want us to disabuse ourselves of the notion that we're going to get there ourselves. At the same time, I want to disabuse ourselves of the idea that only God can do it so we can just sit here, sit on our hands, and do nothing. Our theological language for this is to talk about the inbreaking of the kingdom. That since Jesus, the kingdom is slowly pushing against the boundaries and the structures of this world. And it is changing things, but we only get kind of glimpses. It's, it's on its way, but it's not here yet. And so really the piece I want to ask you to think about today when it comes to the kingdom of God is, is the kingdom just a slightly better version of this life. If we all make 10 changes to our lives, is that the kingdom? Because I think sometimes we fall into this trap in thinking that the kingdom of God is really close and we're almost there. And if we just do these three things, then we can be in the kingdom. I don't think we're that close. I don't think we can do it by ourselves. And I don't think the kingdom of God is just version 7.0 of human empire. So what I want to ask you to think about when you think about the kingdom is what comes to mind? What is the picture in your head when we talk about the kingdom of God? Is it that new heaven and new earth picture in Revelation? You know, where there's gems and gates and pearls and golden streets and trees and rivers running through it, and the lamb is the light of the city. Is that what the kingdom looks like? Is it that vision that we use out of Isaiah when they talk about neither shall they kill or learn war anymore on my holy mountain where the lamb and the lion will lie down together 
and the child can place its hand over the serpent's hole and not be bitten. Is that what we mean? Or do we mean crime's down 2%, the Dow is up 10,000 points, and I can retire a year early? I think there's a challenge to the kingdom that is to imagine something completely different from just better. And that this prayer, this little short clause that we pray every week really gets at that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That would be a fundamental, monumental theological change to how we get through life. And it would have practical changes in our everyday encounters. So what, hap- what needs to happen for that to happen? The confessions have been remarkably consistent since 1563 on the matter. We need to submit more to God. First thing, we need to submit more to God. And they use different language for that, but it keeps coming up and it keeps coming up and it keeps coming up. It comes up in Heidelberg and it comes up in Westminster. And then as we jump forward 330 years, it comes up in belonging to God. And those are the things that we talk about all the time in our spiritual journeys, that we ask God to take this from us, and then what do we do? Here, here God, would you please carry my burden in this regard? Oh, never mind. I'll handle it. I know none of you have ever done that. I mean, I know that's not part of our prayer life, that we put things on God, and then we go, oh, God, really, you're too busy. Let me just handle this because I was handling it so well before. Um, And so a piece of the kingdom is us being willing to actually make Jesus Christ Lord. And we are pretty stubborn about that. A piece of the kingdom, then that the shorter Westminster goes on, is to pray that Satan's kingdom will be destroyed. And that's language that I don't know that our church uses anymore, but I think it's an important piece that there is a competing way to God's kingdom of being in the world. And it's Satan's kingdom. So now if I were to ask you the question, do you want to belong to the kingdom of God or do you want to belong to the kingdom of Satan? I hope I know how you're all going to respond. Do I have anybody who wants to live in the kingdom of Satan out there? Raise your hand if you're a kingdom of Satan passport carrier. Guess what? That means that if we're not living in one kingdom style, we're living in another kingdom style. It needs to be a conscious, prayerful, powerful, repeated decision as to what kingdom we live in. And then we get to the that part of it, that the kingdom of grace may be advanced. Ourselves and others brought into it and kept in it, and that the kingdom of glory may be hastened. And that's got a little more depth to it than just the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of grace and the kingdom of glory. If we want to walk, if we want to live in the kingdom of grace, I don't know about you, but for me, that means I got to be better at giving it than I currently am. To be a citizen of the kingdom of grace, that's something I'm going to need to work on living into. Not there yet. So when we pray this prayer, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to unpack. We're not going to unpack it all today. 
what I really want you to be in prayerful consideration about every time you pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done is what can you do towards that today and tomorrow and the next day and every day of your life? And what is it that you really need God's help to do to do that? We each have a different faith journey to get to where we are. We each have a different growth curve spiritually. And what I want to ask you is when you pray this prayer, what is it you really need to do to be a part of the kingdom of grace and glory? And what part of it are you willing to admit you cannot do without divine intervention? To God alone be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen. Now we've come to that question and answer from Shorter Westminster. You can thank me later that I didn't make it longer Westminster. Um, Sunday school class got to see that part of it and they're very happy not to have to do that. So what is it, what do we pray for in the second petition? In the second petition, which is thy kingdom come, we pray that Satan's kingdom may be destroyed and that the kingdom of grace may be advanced, ourselves and others brought into it and kept in it, and that the kingdom of glory may be hastened. Friends, to that end, let us gather our prayers, our joys, our concerns, our offerings before God. Um, Mary will have an offertory for us that you can be gathering your prayers and your gifts before God, and then we'll go to the prayers of the people. Now we gather together to lift up our joys and our concerns before God. Um, we are three months into this weird new normal, and almost all of us are chomping at the bit for something to give. Um, so I think a, an appropriate prayer would be for us to pray for all the folks who are having to make those decisions around the country for school districts, for hospitals, for government practices, for sporting, for their own family, for everybody who's making those decisions about how we care for our larger community at this time. Um, it would be wise and well for us to pray for them as they make decisions. Um, Will you pray with me? Oh God, we come to you this day because we have gotten glimpses of the kingdom in the birth of pygmy baby hippos and teenagers who get groceries and teenagers who organize for change and in a church that prays for one another. We see glimpses of the kingdom each and every day. And so we come to you this day 
because honestly, we want more than a glimpse. We want it to be real. We want it to be all the time. And we recognize that you're going to have to be part of that, probably the largest part of that. And so we come and we pray for comforting the grieved, for celebrating life. We come and we pray for the hungry and the hurting and the outcast. We come praying for those who have no people. We long that they can say that they are your people. We come praying for those who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we come praying for those who are tired of being at home. Our prayers are with those who lead us and those who must make hard decisions both on our behalf and for us and for themselves. We come to you praying in the middle of a world that seems so different and yet is what it is, your blessed, beloved creation. So we come to you this day longing for more, thankful for what has been given so far, and wanting to see just what might come next. So it is that we pray with the one who starts your kingdom breaking in as he teaches us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, as we go down the hall, out into the world, back to work, as we start to look at the possibilities of being able to be the people of God going, go with your eyes on the kingdom. Go with your heart seeking for God to rule over all. Go Go knowing both that you have a role to play in bringing the kingdom to fruition and that it's not all on you. 
Go with your prayers. Go with the mighty communion of the body of Christ. Go with the great cloud of witnesses and go with the power of God to become a citizen of God's creation, living under God's rule. Friends, go and may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us and abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen. I'm looking for the coming of Christ. I want to be with Jesus. When we have run with patience the race, we shall know the joy of Jesus. In him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. Thank you.